they are going to, under two minutes, review whether or not Brady's arm was in motion. Well, no doubt his arm is going forward. Now, Tom Brady had changed his mind and was not going to throw the football. That's what I was judging my decision on here. The quarterback's arm was going forward. It is an incomplete <laughs> I think it's safe to say, well, it depends on the outcome here, but this will be talked about quite a bit. You think? <laughs> when a teammate player is holding the ball to pass it forward, any intentional forward movement of the arm starts a forward pass, even if the player loses possession of the ball as he is attempting to tuck the ball back into his body. I'll go to my grave thinking it was a fumble. And I believe the pictures uh, speak volumes in terms of um, what the play was truly about. When the games are decided over technical rules that people don't even know exist, including the players and the coaches that are playing in the playoffs, we got a real problem. I grew up in the Midwest, and I had coached for Green Bay, so I'd seen big amounts of snow. But what was amazing about that night is it was beautiful. It was not cold at all. It was almost perfect, only there was, there was two feet of snow on the field. That started out, uh, there was a little bit of snow on the ground. Of course, by the end, it was, uh, you know, you couldn't, couldn't see the lines. You could just see the, the pylons and, and the field markings. It was so dramatic. It was, you know, almost um, romantic, uh, the way the snow was falling and the crowd. And it really, it was, it almost brings a tear to my eye. It wasn't just the weather that made January 19th, 2002, the perfect storm. It was also the first ever divisional playoff held at night and the last game ever at Foxborough Stadium. The game would be decided by the most controversial replay review in NFL history. And the two principal characters were once college teammates. Over the years, the question of what happened has been asked and answered many times. You know, the ball yeah, I was throwing the ball. <laughs> Looking at the left, throwing it, I was going to throw it, and he hit me as I was throwing. <laughs> How do you like that? The, uh, the fumble play, or the non fumble play. The incomplete play. pass? Let's <laughs> talk about the incomplete pass. Yeah, I like that subject. It looked like I was throwing the ball, and I would say it, it did look like that. And they have to have a black and white rule for that. I mean, or else you never know when it's going to be fumble. You never know what's going to be completion. You can't determine the intent of the quarterback. The game was over. The game still should have been over. We should have been out of here a long time ago, and we got beat by the refs tonight. That's the worst call in the history of all sports, I believe. The moment that will forever live in the hearts of the Patriots and will forever be considered the perfect crime to the Raiders began with 150 left in the fourth quarter, and the score, Raiders 13, Patriots 10. I'm 15 yards away from Brady and Coach Weiss. And I hear three by one, trips right, throw the slant the back side. I run in the huddle. I say, listen, guys, they're going to go three by one, throw the slant the back side. So we break the huddle. They line up three by one. I'm like, yes, 
I'm going to get the interception. It was called trips right 68 slant D slant, which means it was trips to the right. We had three slants on the right, and then we had a slant on the backside with a diagonal by the running back. The wheel linebacker was walked up, and there was nobody on the left side of the field. And when you're looking out there at quarterback, you say, God, how can I not throw over there? Well, the problem was it was a blitz zone. So we come with a, a nickel blitz off the corner, and that nickel man is Charles Woodson. He's clean. We didn't have Woodson blocked, and really Tom should have read that and gotten rid of the ball. I see Brady get ready to throw the ball. He doesn't throw it. He brings it back to his body. And my eyes just get big because I know I got him. Pulls the ball back down, and Charles comes in before he can reload it and throw it to me, basically. I started to, th to throw the ball to the left, and the defensive lineman was standing there. And as it was coming down to recock it and get the ball out to the running back, that's when I got hit. Brady standing in there, looks to the left, loses the football. It's on the ground, and it's see if it's a fumble or a pass attempt. I believe it's going to be called a fumble. It is. You know, initially I thought it was a fumble, and we had lost the ball, and they were going to run out the clock. Initially, when he hit me, you know, I thought, well, it's, you know, probably a fumble. And I ran off the field, and I was so pissed. I couldn't believe that I'd fumbled the ball to lose the game. The Raiders take over as Charles Woodson came on a corner blitz, and he rocked his former Michigan teammate, the guy who lockered only two stalls away from him in Ann Arbor, and knocked the ball away. Game is over, and we're going to go on to Pittsburgh. I saw their sidelines, Charlie Weiss, Belichick, all of them, Brady. They knew it was a fumble. We all knew it was a fumble. Until, um, wait a minute, there's a conversation. The play is going to be reviewed, though, Greg. Uh, why? You know, it's upstairs. It's going to review it whether it was a fumble or not, I guess. And, and all of a sudden, the referee said, hey, we're... we're, we're we're looking over this, this play and we're like, what could they possibly be looking at? Now they're telling me up in the booth that there is some concern that Brady was incomplete throwing the football, that his arm was moving forward or he brought it back. Then I start hearing about a tuck rule. Um, I'm hearing language I've never heard and I've been in football my entire life. Walt Coleman, the referee, is going into the monitor booth. I knew that what they were doing at that particular time was trying to find a reason to overturn this play because that was the only reason why it was taking so long. The more time went on, the more everybody on the sidelines like, I think we're, I think we're about to get screwed. Like, I don't know how, but it's about to happen. I saw the play and thought it was a fumble. And I thought, game over, good, no controversy. I saw the first replay and went, uh-oh. When I looked up on the screen, I felt, wow, you know, they're going to overrule this thing. As soon as I saw the replay, I felt pretty good about the situation. I thought, really, that Tom was tucking the ball, and I thought that this is going to be an incomplete pass. As we look at it, Brady's arm was coming forward. Yeah, they're going to have to call it from upstairs. After reviewing the play, the quarterback's arm was going forward. It is an incomplete. All right. Patriots retain the ball. Out of thin air comes the tug rule. What the hell is the tuck rule? What is that? What is that? I've never heard of this. There was no logic to the rule in the minds of just about everybody. The definition of the rule basically says that the forward pass doesn't start when the ball leaves your hand. The forward pass starts with the forward motion of the hand. If you now decide to bring the ball back until you get it to your side or come to a complete stop and start to take off running, it is still a pass based on that initial forward motion. The whole thing was, 
where do you try to try to draw the line to where the arm starts going down versus does it come out when it is it is it parallel here to the ground there was no clear line and and you know at at least at the time the committee felt like this was a bright line this was a bright line it took the guesswork out of it I knew the call was right. I also knew that it was not going to be accepted by the majority of the people because they would read clear intent here that he was not trying to pass the ball when the ball came loose. I have a picture of Brady with the ball down here around his chest, right where Woodson dislodged the ball. And I wrote on there, it was a fumble, exclamation point, John Gruden. And I gave it to Mr. Kraft and it started their dynasty. It sure helped them. Snap, ball down, kick is up. Coming up, the birth of the Patriots dynasty, the rise of Brady and Belichick, the departure of John Gruden, and the demise of the Raiders, the many aftershocks of the tuck rule. The Tuck Rule, one of the most significant moments in NFL history. To fully appreciate its importance, you must first examine what preceded it. Four years before John Gruden and Bill Belichick met that night, they took turns visiting the office of Al Davis. The year was 1998, and Davis was looking for a head coach. But at that time, no one wanted that job. Everybody was scared of the situation. They were scared of Al Davis, scared of moving to California, probably scared of the black hole, I don't know. But I had no fear, no reservations, none. I was a young guy, I believed in myself. I knew I could get some good coaches. And I really wanted to be a Raider coaching for Al Davis. I figured if I was judged by anybody in the business, I'd rather be judged by a man that was coach of the year, commissioner of the league, than somebody that never had anything to do with football. Well, that was the first and only time Al involved me in a coaching search and recommended that he hire Bill Belichick. The thing that stood out to me the most is how smart he is. Um, I learned later from someone that there's an expression for that in the New England area, wicked smart. And I'd never heard that before, but boy, he is so intelligent. And everything he said impressed me. Davis, though, picked Gruden. In his third season, the Raiders were on the verge of making the Super Bowl, but lost at home in the AFC Championship game. The Ravens beat us. Gannon got hurt in a game that hurt us. That might have been a different game if we had Gannon. What's it like in the playoffs, being on that losing side at the end of the game? It's the worst. It's humbling. It's uh, deathly quiet, and it takes you a while to get over the finality of it all. But we were loaded. We won the division again but fall short of the Super Bowl again, losing to the Patriots and their second-year head coach, Bill Belichick, in a game decided by the tuck rule. And this is Billy! Officially 23 yards. Good snap, good hold, the kick is up. The Patriots have won. The tuck rule saves the day for the Patriots and New England will advance to the AFC Championship game. This is embarrassing. There is no other way to put it. Al Davis was seething. Gruden sensed the most intimidating owner in football might direct his anger toward him. He was up giving his speech to the team and he made the comment, he said, they are never going to allow you guys to win here. And so I let everything settle down. I went to him and I asked him, what do you mean by you guys? I mean, you're our coach. So it's we, it's, you know, us. Later, we figured out what you guys meant. My husband and I were out one evening and we got home. And as I'm walking in the house, the phone is ringing and it's Al. I kind of hear like, blah, 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 John Gruden, blah, 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 trade. And so I interrupt. I said, I really think that's a bad idea. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to emphasize this as best as I can. 
I think this is a really bad idea. And he said to me, you didn't hear me. I told you I just did it. One month after losing because of the tuck rule, Davis sent Gruden to Tampa. How did you end up as head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? You know, I really don't know exactly how it all came about. I got a phone call late, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning or so, from uh, Al Davis, and he said, uh, basically, the parameters of a trade has been worked out. Would you like to go to Tampa Bay? And a lot of things transpired in a matter of minutes. And uh, when I woke up the next day, uh, I was kind of shocked, you know, that that much change has, had occurred in, in that short period of time. If we win a divisional playoff game on the road in the snow, no matter what happens in Pittsburgh, I believe that John Gruden remains as a head coach. I don't think he, he leaves. My name is John Gruden, and I am the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. When we return, more aftershocks from the Tuck Rule. January 19, 2002 was the last game ever played at Foxborough Stadium. Because of the tuck rule and its aftermath, it's also the most memorable. But I think his arm was going forward. I know. I saw, I saw the motion. I don't know. I think it was fun. I think he was fun. Well, there's only one guy's opinion that matters. He's been an awful long time ago. At that point, we're all hooping and hollering, and I realized, oh, hey, uh, this is going to come down to me. So I ran back into the net real quick, started warming up again. Before the tuck rule, Adam Vinatieri was not what he became, the greatest clutch kicker in NFL history. In fact, he had missed four of his last five from between 40 and 49 yards. I knew when I was stepping out on the field for a 45-yard field goal and a blizzard with five inches, six inches of snow on the ground, this was going to be the most difficult kick in my entire career to that point and probably in my entire life. I was right there when our defensive coach said to our defensive line, don't even move. There's no way he can make this field goal in the snow. Da, da, da. Just make sure you're not offsides. I knew they weren't going to get a real good push in that snow, so they weren't going to get, you know, real close to me. So I didn't have to potentially hit it quite as high, but I still had to get it over the line of scrimmage. 45 yards is still 45 yards. 45-yard field goal attempt coming up. Snap, ball down. Kick up on the way. You know, at that point, I was like, oh my God, you made it, thank goodness, you know. But it was more of a, more of a relief than, than, than excitement, like, yeah, I did it. It was more like, oh, thank God. If I miss that kick, uh, we're cleaning out our lockers the next day. So uh, stress, pressure, and conditions, I would say that's probably the one that I'm the most proud of and probably the most difficult kick ever. Greatest kick in history, undisputed, Vinatieri. Unbelievable kick. I couldn't even really see the uprights on the other side of the field. It was it was snowing that hard. That ball's kind of curling, and as you see it now, it just kind of sneaks its way into the bottom corner of the upright. At that point, we all jumped up in the air, and, and we couldn't believe that we had come back from 10 down to tie it. Hey man, we're going to play overtime period. The first team who scores wins. The Patriots won the toss. Drew Bledsoe was one of the team captains. He began the year as the starting quarterback but got injured in week two. Before the tuck rule, Tom Brady was mostly known as his replacement. After the tuck rule, he started becoming a legend. In 
in overtime, he went eight for eight, including a fourth down conversion. It is going to be a Cheppy field goal. The crowd will tell you whether he makes it or not. Set to go. Snap. Ball down. Kick is up. That's a game you'll, I'll never forget, and that's with the with the controversial call. I mean, it's like it had every element of every game. You know, you could you could wish for we fourth down conversions in the in overtime and a 48 yarder in the snow. Um, I mean, it's just I mean, what more do you want in a football game? Foxborough Stadium might be gone, but the final game there will never be forgotten. I don't think many people would remember it if we didn't go on and win the next two games. After beating Pittsburgh in the AFC Championship, New England entered Super Bowl 36, a 14-point underdog to the St. Louis Rams. With the game tied in just over a minute to play, Brady marched the team in position for Vinatieri to kick the winning field goal. later in Super Bowl 38, with the score tied in just over a minute to play, Brady and Vinatieri did it again. The Patriots then won Super Bowl 39, their third title in four years. A dynasty had been launched and a quarterback who was largely unknown and unaccomplished before the tuck rule was on his way to becoming the greatest of all time. Tom Brady should start every interview he does by saying, I want to thank the Oakland Raiders for me being here where I am today, because if not for them, I would not be here. Now, what is your question, sir? <laughs> because you know that he doesn't go into the, the next year the starting quarterback if you lose a playoff game at home in the snow to a team from California. No, that's not going to happen. So I, I take nothing away from Tom Brady. I joke about that. But uh, the fact that this man took that opportunity and has made the career of it that he's made, I think is remarkable. And, and it just shows you in life, if you get a break, you know, you can take advantage of it. You know, incredible things can happen. Tom Brady owes me his house. Mm -hmm. I'm the reason why he's married to who he's married to. <laughs> I, I'm the reason for a lot of that. The because big mansion, because everything. They, everything. Because they overturned that call right there. Tom, come on now. Fess up. It was a fumble. It's still a fumble. Coming up, the Raiders' inability to recover from the tuck rule. When the tuck rule was invoked, allowing the Patriots to maintain possession, the Raiders still held a 13-10 lead with just 147 left in regulation. You go from a game being over to football left to play. You would think, okay, you gotta regroup, you gotta get over it, you gotta go out there and finish the game. Sometimes it doesn't quite happen like that. From that moment on, we didn't quite recovered from it. The game, of course, went to overtime. I looked at our players on the sideline. I looked at our coaches on the sideline. I saw the looks on their faces, and I knew it felt like someone reached into my chest and ripped out my heart. And it looked to me from the looks on their faces that they felt that way too. I knew we would lose the game. It'll be 23 yards away for Adam Vinatieri to win the game for New England. There it is, folks. Even before the controversial immaculate reception, and continuing through decades of legal battles with the NFL, Al Davis was suspicious of any outcome that went against his Raiders. To this day, we don't know what happened. We don't know who made the call, what was said, 
amongst the replay guy upstairs and the official downstairs. I don't know who else was in the booth. I know of things that were done with the networks. I know that the head of officials is still out there trying to spin it, that we had a tuck rule and that was really not a fumble. I mean, it's ridiculous. I felt like all of the things that they said about Al Davis and the NFL and that whole conspiracy thing, it was true. Some bullshit. You know, that's uh, exactly how I feel. I felt it was a bullshit call. Never should have been overturned. Charles, it became personal for him. Clearly a fumble. You know, the guy was going to throw the ball. He pumped it, he brought it back down. And uh, then I hit him, the ball came out. Clearly a fumble. So you totally disagree with the fact it was overturned? Damn right I disagree. I still believe that that's the longest reviewed play in the history of the NFL. I think it went 12 minutes. Do you think it was an out-and-out -out conspiracy against the Raiders? It's hard to say that it wasn't, you know what I mean? Um, you know, I think, um, again, for that to be the longest reviewed play in the history of a, a review meant that they were searching for something. It's like in boxing, they always say you can't leave it up to the judges. Yeah, with us, we couldn't leave it up to the referees. You know, we had to win by more than one play. It couldn't be a one play decision because chances are we weren't going to get that decision. They weren't going to call the game. They were looking for a reason to, to give the other team a, a play. And I, look, I, I know that sounds way out there, but at the same time, when you're the and black, man, you, <laughs> you think of a whole bunch of stuff. People trying to say that what goes on between the league and, and Al Davis doesn't affect What's, what happens on the field, but um, I mean, there's no way you can tell me that that's so. Al Davis thinks the league is against him. <laughs> this is further evidence. <laughs> yeah. While the elements caused a delay to spot the ball after the ruling, the most discussed review in NFL history actually lasted less than one minute. Since that fateful night in <laughs> Foxborough, <laughs> There's been a lot of attention focused on the tuck rule and whether or not the tuck rule was appropriately applied that night, and it was not. But I think what's missing in the entire dialogue and analysis is this. What is the fundamental underpinning of the replay system? You have to have indisputable visual evidence. Now let's talk about the word indisputable. That means you can't dispute it. It's not disputable. Let's just think about these synonyms for indisputable. Um, irrefutable, look, I wrote them down. Indisputable, incontrovertible, uncontestable, irrefutable, undeniable. How does that meet any of those tests? They were never an organization, you know, that really truly let anything go. Bob Kraft requested the late time slot on Saturday night, and he got exactly what he wanted. He got a warm weather team, and he got the snowstorm. You're having to play a night game in Massachusetts in winter, 19th game, 19th week of the season. Okay, what is this? You're gonna get this one. I promise. I promise that. You smiling ear to ear, Bob Kraft. Al Davis on the other side was not real happy. As a Raider, we just said, well, this is something that's against us. And we felt uh, just another thing that we had to play above. They still send me the picture of Charles Woodson, and they said he had stopped his throwing motion. Well, guess what? A still shot can make anybody look like they stopped their throwing motion. It's a still shot. The next year, when the officials came to our camp, we got up and walked out. The old guys were like, we're going to walk out. We're going to walk out. As soon as the refs come up to speak, we're leaving. We just want you guys to know, we get it. We get that you guys don't like us. And this is our only way to protest, so this is what we're gonna do. The tuck rule made the Raiders resentful, but didn't immediately derail them. Behind new coach Bill Callahan, they reached the Super Bowl the following season, where they faced the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and their coach, John Gruden. You gotta love this, don't you? Two coaches who had changed jobs as a result of one call. I thought Callahan was capable, and then I realized this dude didn't change one formation, one play. John Gruden knows everything that's gonna happen. And it throws one down the middle, intercepted by Derek Brooks. He may score. Good! Derek Brooks scores a touchdown. 
Mike, every play they run, we ran in practice. I know. I don't understand that. Dudes out there yelling, it's like practice. It's like practice. We're at the Super Bowl. Super Bowl, baby! Boom, boom, boom! I've had great days and bad days in football. Yeah! You could feel as low as you can possibly be one year, and the next year you can be at the highest you'll ever be in your life. Tampa Bay Bucks beat the Oakland Raiders 48 to 21. Coming up. If a quarterback is holding the ball in both hands <laughs> yes. and the defender then strips him, yes. does this new rule make that a fumble? You know, it's, yeah, it's always it, that's a fumble. It's always been a fumble. Thank no, you. Hold, hold it now, now. <laughs> now, hold it now. After reviewing the play, the quarterback's arm was going forward. It is a I don't know how many people in that stadium heard of the tuck rule, but somewhere in the archives of the NFL, way back on page, I don't know, there's this rule called the tuck rule. I don't know the tuck rule. I didn't get into whole, you know, all that. I don't believe this call is accurate. Interestingly, it was the, a very similar play to what happened earlier in the season when we played the Jets, when Anthony Pleasant hit Vinny Testaverde. I oh, thought his arm was coming his forward. His arm was coming forward. They've got it, and the guy upstairs has got to review that. That is an incomplete pass. It was the same thing. We hit him, the ball came out, we recovered, and we felt like it was our ball, but Vinny was bringing the ball back into his body. It was a very similar play to the Oakland play. No question about it. His arm was coming forward. So uh, when I saw the replay on it, I knew what the ruling should have been because we had dealt with that play a little bit earlier in the year on the other side of it. That had happened four or five times earlier this, that season. There was a similar play with, with the Rams early in the year on Monday Night Football. I remembered it like it was yesterday at the time. Yeah, you can argue that his arm was coming forward, but the intent of the quarterback, I think you got to look at that. You can see that Warner is not trying to release that ball. He's trying to hang on to it. And they called it some tuck rule or something. To reviewing the play, the quarterback is in control of the ball with his arm moving forward. When the ball comes out, it's an incomplete forward pass. Whoa. Bad call. The rule had been interpreted the same way for decades, with the tuck wording being officially added to the rule book in 1999. What's funny is that Billy Joe pulls the ball back, and then it came up. You see, Billy pulls it down. At that point, I don't think it's a pass anymore. That should be ruled a fumble. After reviewing the play, by rule, when the quarterback's arm is going forward, it's a forward pass until he gets the ball tucked all the way into his chest. The quarterback did not get the ball all the way back into his chest, so it is an incomplete pass. The thing is, it was so impactful, but it wasn't that unusual. After 2001, everyone in the NFL knew all about it. Why are they thinking it's a forward pass? You gotta be kidding me. Oh, slipped out the of old head. tuck rule. That's a tuck rule. I think it is a tuck play, I tell it you. Might be, yeah. It looks the like his arm is coming arms forward. going forward. Yeah. And they hit the ball out of his arm when he's trying to stop the throw. Tuck rule. Yeah. Tuck rule. He's, he's going like this. He's pulling it back. That's a tuck rule. Watch this. Greenwood. Tom Brady pulled the Let's go. There ain't no tuck rule. That's a fumble. I went to competition committee meetings before and said, I don't like the rule, we need to change it. But I couldn't get any backing. I ran into a wall. They didn't want to try to justify all the Raiders' complaints, and they didn't want to taint the Patriots' victory. Well, this is a major change in the NFL. The rule that helped the Patriots win their first Super Bowl? out. Steve Burton joins us now with more. And Steve, well, it was good while it lasted for yeah, us. At least, uh, <laughs> you're right. And what am I doing? This is that rule. Remember? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know that famous tuck rule that Tom Brady and the Pats beat Oakland with? Well, it's gone. 2019 is voted to eliminate that rule at the NFL owners meetings today out in Phoenix, Arizona. Is the non-throwing hand part of the body? Is that a trick question? No. <laughs> is that part of the body? 
What's the purpose of the question? Well, if, if, a, if, if a quarterback is holding the ball like this in both hands uh, yes. and the defender then strips him, yes. does this new rule make that a fumble? It always has been. Yeah, it's always, it, that's a fumble. It's always been a fumble. Thank no, you. Hold, hold it now, now. Now, hold it now. Hold it now, now. This is, not a began, this is not a retroactive rule. Yes. Congratulations to whoever had the great idea of getting rid of that rule. That's a clean fumble. It's amazing now, we look back on it, that a rule that doesn't exist costs you a chance to go to the Super Bowl. That doesn't make me feel too good. <laughs> Common sense to me is the best platform to put your uh, bricks on, and, and I think that's what they finally did with the tuck play. If it's a fumble to the guy sitting at the bar, it should be a fumble to the NFL. Greg Beekert recovers the fumble, and Beekert has pretty much sealed an Oakland Raider victory here in New England. It's the 50 guys in, in the bar that were all drunk that finally said, come on, this doesn't make sense. I want it back. I want the tuck rule back because we were victimized by it, and I want to look my, you know, assailant in the face. It's one of those plays that you're involved with as an official that you'll be remembered almost for the rest of your life. Uh, Walt Coleman. That's a shame. <laughs> I can't remember what I had for dinner yesterday, but I can remember his name. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Here comes Walt Coleman. And now the explanation for John Gruden. Boy, what a decision. Since the conclusion of the 2001 season, Walt Coleman hasn't officiated a single Raiders game. So that just lets you know. That's admitting something right there. That's hilarious in my mind. It's, it's funny that uh, I, I didn't realize that. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. People ask me, and of course I work for the league, oh no, it's just coincidence, you know, it's just coincidence, you know, it just, uh, it was a coincidence. I hope you stress out wherever you are, baby. Get ready and come get some, baby. Environment that now some 16, 17 years later, it's still fresh on everybody's mind in Oakland. Worst game Raiders history. Uh, who would it be? Come on, man, you know it's the Patriots, man. It's you and it's, it's, it's the call. It's the call. It's going to be the snow. The tuck rule. <laughs> tuck rule all day. The worst call in the world. I did send him to New England, though, by the way. Yeah, why the heck not? I knew he had never done a Raider game, but I did not know that he had done 17 Patriot games. That upsets me a little bit. It's the reason why this thing will never go away. Coming up, the legacy of the tuck rule. It's tough, it's really tough. I'm telling you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of guys are going to therapy over this doggone game, man. Like almost no other moment, a large chunk of NFL history can be marked in relation to the notorious Tuck Rule. After the Tuck Rule, Tom Brady and the Patriots reached seven of the next 16 Super Bowls. And the New England Patriots win the Super Bowl 49, 28, 24. In 2016, the Oakland Raiders finally returned to the playoffs after missing out for 13 straight seasons. The long drought is over. The Raiders are going back to the playoffs. But once again, it was the Patriots who won the Super Bowl, their fifth title since the play that altered the course of two franchises. White cuts inside. He digs. He dives. It is a touchdown. The Patriots have won Super Bowl 51. I've always loved this photo because it sort of was the turning point and the catalyst of this great run that we've had. I love it because it's a statement on life. It's sort of how people view things. Okay, it's 2001, the tuck rule. 
Why? Why? That is definitely the style of it all right there. Why would you bring up the tuck rule in Oakland? <laughs> it's the beginning. Absolutely. Uh, Started it all. <laughs> what is that rule? Huh? They Never heard of it. that in how long? Wait, Never heard what? of it. And then right after, they take it off the book. Right, exactly. I'm wrong with that. I was a little nervous about it, but it was it was the greatest call in football history. Obviously, it's no good because they already got rid of it. Yeah. They, they was invented for us, and then after that, they said that wasn't no good. What should we do with this picture? Burn it! Burn it! Burn it! Come on. Yeah, yeah! This was probably one of the first games I can ever actually remember in sports, and ever since then, it's just been championships and wins, so feels good. What y'all think I should do with this? What y'all think I should do with this? That's what I think of that. That's what I think of that. The whole 15-year run and the five Super Bowls all happened because it wasn't a fumble. What's the legacy of the tuck rule? The legacy of the tuck rule is, uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, it's, it's uh, let's not over-officiate, over-legislate. Let's not decide football games. Let's not reverse calls unless they're clearly reversible. If you were to ask me um, what was the biggest play in, uh, in my time, uh, you know, in the office, it was clearly the tuck play. Who would have thought that a rule would have a Wikipedia with the history of the tuck rule? I know the Raiders would have another Super Bowl trophy by now. I know that. It was our chance to go to a Super Bowl. And to have that taken away from you is, is tough. It's really tough. I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of guys are going to therapy over this doggone game, man. I still feel a little bit cheated. It's because I expected, I expected to play in a Super Bowl. It was the right rule at the right time. They made the right call, and I guess they changed it because they didn't feel it was right. But for me, it helps me have a ring, so I guess I'm okay with it. I'm glad it worked the way it did, or else we wouldn't be wearing the Super Bowl ring. Tom Brady stands alone as the only quarterback to win five Super Bowl rings. For his former college teammate, the man who has relived the tuck rule more than anyone, some answers have come easier than others. Would you put him in the category of absolute best of all time? He is the greatest of all time. There, there's no discussion. Wow. That is point <clears throat> blank, period. That's it. Tom Brady, greatest quarterback of all time. If he wins this day, so I've seen Tom a few times uh, since then. Of course, we text. That has never come up. The tuck rule has never come up. I imagine maybe sometime, you know, in the future, Maybe I'll just sit down with a man in a, maybe in a, in a lonely bar somewhere, just me and him. And I'll just ask him point blank, Tom, just, just tell me. If you could just tell everybody in the world what it was, what was it? I know what he would say. I think I know. <laughs> 